Welcome back everyone. We will be commencing soon. Please hold us with a couple of minutes. Hello, Nima sir. Hello, Nima sir. The mouth is fine. Hello, Namrata, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, am I audible clearly? Yes, you are audible. Oh, okay, ma'am. We'll wait for a couple of minutes more so that others can join too. Good morning, ma'am. Namrita. Yeah, uh, Suhan, how are you? Fine, fine. Good morning, everyone. Can Good I morning. Uh, present my uh, PPT? Uh, no, no ma'am. Not this time. And there is a keynote address by Professor Arshan Moor Siddiqui. After that, uh, session one will start. Okay, okay. Right, ma'am? 
ओके 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 मैम I can see. Uh, no, it is. Uh, I have. Uh, uh. Yes, Namrata. Yes, Good sir. Morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning, uh, Doctor Devendra. Good morning. Good morning, Doctor uh, Namrata. Good morning, uh, Doctor Namrata. I think sir has joined, so you may yes, sir. Start, right? Yeah, Siddharth, you can start. Sure, ma'am. Welcome back, everyone. I think you are now all geared up and energized. Hello, I am Siddharth Shivastava, a third-year student of Ajay Kumar Engineering College. I would like to carry on with this conference further. Dedicated leaders act as inspiration to their people around them. A positive thought process in a leader empower people to accomplish their goal. A good objective of leadership is to help those who are doing poorly to do well and to help those who are doing well to do even better. Before we invite Dr. Ashut Nur Siddiqui to address the conference, we'd like to introduce Dr. Ashut Nur Siddiqui to you all. Dr. Ashut Nur Siddiqui is currently a professor at Jamia Millia Islamia University, New Delhi, India. He received his bachelor's from Government Engineering College, Jawalpur, India, in Mechanical Engineering and Master's and PhD degree in Production Engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, India. His broad research is in production engineering and specific areas include friction steel processing and welding, materials technology and structure property correlation. Apart from serving Government of India statutory body AICTE on deputation, he also look after Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, CIE Jamia Millia Islamia. As in charge of CIE, he also proposed the technology transfer policy for the university. As coordinator, innovation and startup policy, JMI, he brought out this draft startup policy of Jamia Millia Islamia. He has supervised several PhDs and has published more than 210 <laughs> publications, mostly SCI and a number of books. Apart from publication, he is also contributing in SCI Journal Plus, one as associate editor. He is the CRC's book series editor on advanced manufacturing technique. He has applied and received several patents too. He was also invited as a visiting professor at Advanced Manufacturing Institute, King Saud University, KSU. Alongside KSU, he is also an active international research cooperation with Wenzhou University, China, Semra National Research University, Russia, and Sizer University, Canada. So, may I request Dr. A. N. Siddiqui to enlighten us with his knowledge? Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Siddhartha. Thank you, sir. And uh, I must uh, thank the HOD of uh, Mechanical Engineering Department, AKG EC, and Dr. Namta Gangil Gupta, who is the coordinator of this uh, magnificent event. And I really thank all these uh, to uh, make me a part of this grand event. Uh, thank you very much. And nonetheless, uh, I also thank AKGEC for uh, envisaging and uh, organizing such an event, and which is one of the most contemporary theme. And uh, I believe the participation, wide participation, as I can see, uh, will definitely benefit all the stakeholders that are uh, actually involved in this particular theme. Thank you so much. And I also um, uh, humble, get humbled with uh, the introduction that you gave about me, uh, Siddhartha. Thank you so much. And uh, to straight away come up to the um, topic, uh, I have tried to choose a topic that is uh, in alignment with the theme. So I'll just uh, share my uh, PPT. 
and uh, straight uh, away log on to it. Believe you are able to see my PPTs, my screen. Are you able to see? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, because the uh, conference pro proceedings are uh, being published by materials today proceedings one of the uh, best uh, platform for publishing the material on the, uh, on this team and uh, also the title and theme of the conference i thought uh, i must uh, say a few words because the time is very short and limited on thus far and the way forward through the material that is how i put it like this we are here today and how we reached here and uh, where we can actually uh, uh, envisage to be in future so this is actually regarding material journey uh, of materials how we have evolved as human being and wh where we are heading to a very a quick, a quick um, uh, precursor to where we were earlier historically known to be there and uh, till present i'll uh, scan through four or five slides and then uh, come on to the topic of advanced materials that are uh, contemporary times the historical records say that uh, the human beings uh, have been uh, living and making use of different tools and uh, making out livelihood through the ages of paleolithic age and that lasted somewhere around uh, 34 uh, lakhs of years, 340 years, of 340,000 years from now. So that age is known as the Stone Age. And uh, we must uh, realize that whatever human being that point in time used to do was the driving force was to do, um, actually gather the food for a livelihood. And this is how we were, uh, we, used to, we, we used to look, our ancestors used to be looking at that point in time. And uh, you can see that the brains were short because most of the food was consumed raw. So the most of the work that required to be done and the energy was consumed in the stomach. So the stomach was huge and the brain was less because we make use of very less amount of brain. And the kind of food that we were consuming was the raw. And the material that we were using mostly stone, and that is the flint. But one important aspect is that they have definite geometry. And uh, the mechanical engineers will uh, recognize that these geometries are very well uh, akin to the tool geometry. And we can see that the geometry of the tool ever since we started using them since the Paleolithic age till now it has not changed. It has not changed. The geometry of the tool has not changed so far. Several hundreds of thousands of years have passed, but the geometry remains the same. The only way that is changed is the way we, we, we make use of them. Say, for example, we have a knife, we can cut a mango and we can use that, that knife to cut the mango tree as well it depends on how you use them so the geometry did not change the way we use the tool that changed a lot because of which we are here today so these are all the livelihood habitats that uh, used to be there at that point in time and uh, then came the big invention that is known as the fire so the fire at that point in time was new and it actually uh, was so difficult to uh, initiate that once it was lit, people used to keep everything, to do everything to keep it safe, burning, Akhanda Jyoti like, so that they do very uh, small amount of uh, um, effort to reignite it again. So this actually suddenly what happened is that the with the uh, invention of uh, fire the people used to know that anything that is actually 
kept in fire it can be cooked and then it can be digested easily and that is where actually the uh, uh, the work of stomach reduced and the work of brain came and hence we started growing in terms of brain like that and then the new materials came and uh, this is how it is neolithic age the very first age after the stone age is uh, the bronze age and uh, because the, we started making use of brain too much and uh, our brains developed and hence we started making use of uh, brains creative for creativity and gradually we evolved then came the um, invention the turning point of uh, the modern day that is known as the wheel and the invention of wheel that was uh, dates back to 5000 years or so but uh, i personally believe that the first revolution did not came with the invention of wheel but it came with the ignition of fire these are some of the glimpses uh, and with the historical timeline and the milestone milestones so as we started uh, uh, developing in terms of brains then it, it, it actually initially our in, intentions were noble and very humble and very innocent they were limited for food only but as we gathered wealth because of application of brain then it actually translated into aristocracy and that is how you can see that we we resorted to excess wealth was utilized in aristocracy and then the aristocracy and wealth both led to greed and then the began the battles and fights this is how it is so you can see that ever since the invention of uh, brass and bronze or a copper age then we came the multi material here it is the multi material that is uh, known as the sky disk it was discovered in germany and it it it, it may it is made of uh, uh, silver gold and bronze and this is how the people used to start the use of brain and mostly for the aristocracy and of of course for the uh, fight and battle the bronze age uh, lasted for around uh, 3200 years and 1600 bc the um, iron was discovered in turkey one of uh, my friend dr sarir from turkey uh, i'm sorry for in, in the neighbor of turkey is sitting here it was actually found in Turkey. You can see that this is the driving force uh, until that point in time is the development, wealth, power, supremacy, and aristocracy mainly until the medieval times came in the world. And I'll quickly scan through that particular age. You can see another uh, look at the uh, materials aspect of uh, this particular planet globe. So this is somewhere around 1500 BC in Greece. There is a story and uh, that mythological story says that there were two uh, persons. One was the, um, uh, one was uh, Daedalus and his brother's son, that is the nephew, he was in Karas in carriers they were actually uh, able to make uh, wings they could fly so because of that uh, the noble persons at that point in time they got hold of him because they were uh, getting very much popular then they imprisoned them so there they built a um, uh, built a, a wing and that wing was 100 percent biocompatible and uh, the story says that the wing, wings were so big and so powerful that once those wings were uh, worn by the nephew Icarus, and then he flew too high, then his uncle told, "Okay, Icarus, don't go far; otherwise, you will the the sun will burn your uh, wings." So the driving force was mythology that point in time. Point in time. Now, see, you can see that this is actually Timbuktu. There, actually, the trade of for salt was there. The people used to carry gold to that particular place and they exchange for equal weight of salt because salt was very precious at that point in time. 
and until very recently in the 20th century early 20th century the salt was very important because the dandi march in uh, india is a very famous world famous historical turning point so salt salt was very precious at that point in time and it is not very far it is around 1100 ad so from mythology to the livelihood then came the uh, might that is uh, the chengesh khan he made use of um, um, hard iron uh, uh, swords and uh, the composite material uh, uh, arrows and uh, then he tried to win over most of the globe and then came the napoleon and uh, napoleon was the one who at whose time the <laughs> aluminum was invented so this is how it is from the stone to bronze to um iron and then came uh, the aluminum the aluminum is the most recent material in the modern times so all these things actually greed led to fight and then it 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 was the devastating time for uh, the mankind because uh, during world war 1 1912 and the world, world war 2 that uh, was the mid century around it uh, we saw a huge destruction and after that people used to learn that the might is better than fight and there is no point in fighting then the driving force simply changed to supremacy you grow in terms of might so much that people don't fight with you so this is what is currently the uh, driving force so that led to evolution of uh, the supremacy kind of uh, driving force uh, then evolved the uh, aeronautical power and it evolved with uh, the um, white brothers who built uh, the airplane that made of wood 100% wood and fabric then came the 100% uh, steel uh, aircraft then came the 100% duralumin aluminum alloy Uh, aircraft and now it is the composite material aircraft that is the dream liner okay so this is these are all the evidences of supremacy so now the the, the supremacy is continuing now and uh, a, until recently we changed from the iron to silicon age and the silicon age mainly actually facilitated further material development that's all it is so the and recent material developments uh, being materials that are design based and because uh, it has to um, cater to the needs of uh, needs of future aeronautics and this is what is the future of aeronautics looks like and they are in terms of slim they are in they are high in terms of power they are l- low in terms of energy consumption and they cut across not only the skies but the land but also the seas you can see the tube uh, through the bed of uh, seas and oceans which is connecting land bodies and uh, they are uh, actually the um, uh, tube transportation by high speed trains so this has brought us to a very materialistic uh, Uh, times and uh, then uh, very recently in the past decade <laughs> the globe met and we uh, actually identified the challenges of the globe and these challenges are these this supremacy uh, mm, a philosophy has put a lot of uh, stress on this globe which actually led to the uh, danger to sustainability and the sustainability dangers actually uh, caused um, uh, urgent uh, efforts in order to save the planet from getting further destroyed and these are all known as the sustainable development goals and these goals actually talk of not only the um, uh, climate change but also talk of energy the talk of climate change global health very sustenance of uh, each and every living being on this planet be it agriculture be it forest or be it um, any living being so these are all uh, the various agenda items of sdgs so you can see that everyone has uh, everything to contribute not only the mechanical engineers and material scientists but if you see 
the energy, the climate change, the global health, the agriculture and food, communication, housing and mobility, these are all one thing in common, that is the material required. To uh, all these uh, philosophies put a huge uh, stress on the use of material. I am left with 10 minutes, so I'll try to sum up very quickly. So if you see the single most important element in all these agenda items is the material. We need a material to withstand extreme and varying service conditions and loadings for designated technical requirements. So the single most important common uh, factor in all these agenda items is the material. Hence, you can also substantiate through the uh, development of uh, humankind, like you know, it is uh, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and uh, the Iron Age, and now the Silicon Age. These ages are actually correct, are identified through the development in material, developments in materials. So, what actually is the most important factor in the breakthrough develop, development and uh, re uh, revolutions is the material. We are restricted by material. Hence, the current need is that in order to address to the concerns of the SDGs or the sustainable development goals, we need to have materials that are more energy efficient, that are, that are lighter in weight and that can uh, possess uh, omnipotent property, universal property. Not only we, earlier we used to talk of strength, then we used to talk of wear resistance, then we used to talk of heat resistance. All these properties are mutually contradictory. Now the need is that all these contradictory properties are actually uh, get evolved into a single material. That is the need. It is not only the material development, but how these materials can be designed and how these materials can be developed, manufactured into useful items. So the materials, their development, their design and their manufacturing, that is actually the single most common agenda of the SDGs of today's time. So this is uh, one of the um, uh, uh, screenshots of uh, the SDGs that relate to the aviation sector. And the aviation sector SDG has certain goals mm -hmm. and they have the target for 2050. That's why 2050 is an important milestone as far as the UNO's uh, SDG agenda is concerned. For each and every agenda item, they have uh, set a target of approximately uh, 28 years from now and uh, those targets will be actually uh, like this in terms of uh, the aviation sector targets. We have to go a long way. We have to reduce the emissions by 90%. We have to um, reduce the noise by 65%. Uh, so these are all the targets that are set. So these targets are so stringent that uh, the uh, aviation industry is very, very, and very stressed in order to develop new materials. So the future challenge is this, fuel efficiency is there, engine efficiency is there as far as the um, transportation sector is concerned and the synergy between the design and, uh, and manufacturing of the light and strong material and adapting the manufacturing technology to uh, with ease of manufacturing of these high end materials. So you can see that all these things are related to materials only. Fuel efficiency is related to material, engine efficiency is uh, related to material, energy is related to, to manufacturing is also related to, to material. Everything comes down onto a common single factor that is known as the material development and the best choice of material. This is how we have been evolving in terms of the use of materials. This is the first uh, industrial revolution. This is the second industrial revolution and now we are I mean, amidst the third industrial revolution uh, and uh, industry 4.0 now, we are in the transition stage. This is where it is. So driving force for the uh, new material development is the uh, strength, not only strength earlier, until very recently, it was the strengthening. So that if the strength is high, then the weight will be reduced. And if the weight is reduced, then the energy consumption will be less. So there are very traditional ways of strengthening. One is the grain refinement, another one is the um, 
uh, cold work and uh, most mechanical engineers must be knowing it and uh, then the solid solution strength and then heat treatment but the thing is that all these four philosophical ways of heat treatment actually okay four minutes to go uh, have a trade off for the ductility ductility is an important property so there is always a trade off between strength and ductility that is where we are limited now so there is a breakthrough in this that is known as the high entropy alloy the high entropy alloy can have the contradictory properties the, the high entropy alloys can have the strength they can have the hardness they can have the ductility they can have the toughness all these properties simultaneously increasing so the high entropy alloys uh, work on a different concept than the typical and conventional um, alloys uh, which actually are governed by the hume rothery rules they don't govern by the hume rothery rules rather they govern by the entropy configurational entropy of mixing this is how it is a uh, quick scan through on the materials uh, the quest of material was be began with multi uh, metal matrix composite then came to um, nano OD ods oxide dispersion strengthening through the in situ uh, reinforcement generation then came the heavy metal max phase max phase is the metal and the uh, multi metal with the carbon and nitrogen so they, they are these are the very huge atoms uh, molecules of uh, more than hundreds of atom in a single molecule then came the high entropy alloy it is among the highest in terms of uh, the current status and it is still in the uh, lab scale so this is one of the quick reference uh, of how the uh, high entropy alloys placed with a with high temperature strength so you can see that this uh, high high entropy alloy you can see if you increase the temperature from room temperature to as great as 1000 degrees celsius they hardly see 40% uh, drop in their uh, uh, hottest uh, hot hardness and even at 1000 degrees celsius they show uh, approximately 450 to 460 hv hardness which is approximately the bainite room temperature hardness so it's uh, remarkable in terms of high temperature properties this is what is the philosophy of uh, high entropy alloys so high entropy alloys are uh, categorized in three categories low entropy medium entropy and high entropy it all depends on what is the configurational entropy and the configurational entropy greater than 1.5 actually uh, characterizes the high entropy alloys you can see a few of the uh, configurational uh, entropies of some of the common materials low alloy steel you can see 0.22 times r r is the gas constant whereas bulk metallic glasses these are the medium entropy alloys this is how it is you can see the entire space for the uh, high entropy alloy it's unlimited in finite number of uh, new high entropy alloys uh, can be uh, designed so these are this is the in true sense the uh, design based material you can there is no limit on uh, the design of high entropy alloys now all these things are facilitated due to the silicon age because silicon age has uh, developed it and computing facilities computing facilities actually enhance the design of material so now the silicon age will be transformed into a few new design based material uh, 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 classes so one of the most important uh, methods that are thus far being used for the manufacturing of high, high entropy at the laboratory scale is the spark plasma sintering it has several limitations but a huge number of advantages vis-a-vis -vis conventional methods of manufacturing like casting huge it is faster and quicker but the problem is that uh, the, 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 it requires a lot of iteration so you may you make once then you repeat it repeat it three four times then only you can homogenize and make up come out with high entropy alloys these are all some of the characteristics of high entropy alloys they have high strength ductility oxygen corrosion resistance, uh, irradiation resistance enhance the nuclear power application and neuron absorption capacity single material all properties so this is what is the uh, thus far development in the new entropy uh, high entropy alloys 
until now it is laboratory scale it is being uh, done developed by the um, uh, spar plasma sintering and the uh, recent development most recent development are the production of high entropy alloys through additive manufacturing technologies and the, a number of papers are being reported on the manufacturing of uh, the high entropy alloy through additive manufacturing. The screenshot that you are seeing is our common paper, Dr. Namta Gangil, myself and Professor uh, Chiang Chen of China. We are working on high entropy alloy development through uh, uh, additive manufacturing technologies, laser-based melting, and sometimes the uh, um, CMT-based uh, additive manufacturing technology. So it, these are all the liquid phase. But the need of the hour is uh, the solid state uh, process uh, to develop uh, high entropy alloys. So far, only the powder metallurgy, that too, along with the spark plasma sensing, <laughs> which actually is the melt state. But we are the first to evidence the um, uh, HEA in FSP. And uh, one paper has been communicated in uh, the Nature Journal, that is the uh, scientific reports. Uh, it's our joint work. Dr. Namta is also there. Myself is there. Few people from outside are there. Uh, outside India, they are also there. So this is the latest developments in the HEAs, and so far we are working on it. That's how we finish. And I am uh, sorry, I am actually three minutes uh, exceeded uh, to the time limit that has been assigned to me. Thank you so much. And uh, to conclude, I must thank AKG. And I could see uh, uh, the HOD and Dr. Namta Gangel and uh, uh, the uh, AKG administrative staff is also there. I must thank them all for giving me this opportunity to be part of this magnificent program. Thank you so much. Dr. Ashwinur Siddiqui, on behalf of everyone here today, I would like to thank you for taking the time to speak to us today on such important topics of how we humans achieve different milestones about how aeronautics evolved and how it will evolve in the coming future and how materials and advanced materials cover each and every sector. Your comments on sustainable growth and what challenges we carry forward to achieve it was certainly insightful and inspirational. Once again, sir, thank you so much for your valuable insights. Now, I'd like to watch all the participants. Thank you, sir. Of thank you so much. I take thank my leave sir. now. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Namrata, ma'am, should we carry forward with the technical sessions? Yeah. So uh, now set to. Questions are provided in the chat box. So please join accordingly as per your session. All the participants are requested to join their session accordingly uh, on the link provided. Yes, Siddharth. Yeah, Continue. So, uh, like I want to urge all the participants of technical session one to stay here and link for technical session two and three is provided in the chat box as well as shared in your WhatsApp group. So please join the required meeting so that we can move ahead with the presentation. Yeah, Harif yeah. sir with, uh, with us. I think we can start the technical session one. Yes, sir. Harish, uh, Harish sir has joined the session. Oh, ma'am, shall we start? I yeah, think, good think, afternoon, Harish, sir. I think Damrata. Yes. Then tell us about technical sessions. Two kiss link. Then everyone uh, will wait for two minutes more so that everyone uh, will 
will join then we will start dear participants you can join for session 2 and 3 on different links session 1 participant will remain in the same link the session 1 session 1 will be on the same link two uh, for the links the... of session 2 and 3 are provided in the chat box and whatsapp as well please join according to your schedule we are having harish sir with us uh, harish sir can you uh, hear us good afternoon madam uh, good afternoon sir here. how are you sir i am fine madam Uh, ma'am, shall I start, or I should? Be yeah, Tanushri, you can start it now. Okay, ma'am. Jai Hind, everyone. I, Tanushri, and in of AKGC will serve as the moderator for the day. Now is the time to get started with our technical round. We have our session chair with us, Dr. Harish Kumar. He is currently working at National Institute of Technology, Delhi, as a professor. He has earned his PhD degree from Guru Gobind Singh Indraprastha University and also Bachelor's of Technology from the same. He has published more than sixty general articles, more than forty-five conference proceedings, seven books, and many more. He has expertise in mechanical measurement and metrology, additive manufacturing. and metal matrix composite he has also a life member at international association of engineer hong kong and metrology society of india and a fellow member at international science congress so without any further ado let's get started now i would like to welcome dr harish kumar to engage with the audience over to you sir so thank you uh... Thank you uh, for intro introduction. So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the conference organizer, HOD sir, Namrata Madam, for giving me an opportunity. So, uh, I would like to now request the participants, as per schedule, to present their paper in order. So, first paper is of. Uh, so I have to list. Me, I am. Uh, uh, so, uh, before starting with the technical session, there are certain rules to be followed during the paper presentation. Every participant will get maximum of ten minutes to present their paper, followed by five minutes of question and answer session. Now, I would like to call Suha K. Shihab in the spotlight to present their paper on the title. mechanical and physical characteristics of hybrid particles fiber polymers and composites a review yes uh, good, uh, uh, good morning everyone uh, first i would like to introduce myself uh, i am suha karim shihab uh, i am a teacher in university of jale in department of uh, mechanical uh, material engineering uh, from iraq Uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, I'm going today to present my uh, PPT uh, entitled just. Please, uh, uh, screen is able to see. Yes, ma'am. It is uh, visible. Okay. Uh, our uh, presentation entitled "Mechanical and Physical Characteristics of Hybrid Particles, Fibers, uh, Polymer Composite Review." 
it uh, seems from the uh, title that uh, our uh, study is uh, a review study. Uh, outline of this uh, PPT, uh, aims of the study, hybrid composite materials, mechanical uh, characteristics, uh, and physical characteristics. Uh, we will talk about the conclusion, the references. Uh, first, we uh, have to uh, uh, explain the aims of this study. Actually, advances in the mechanical and the physical behavior of polymer hybrid composites uh, materials uh, have a, a great impact, uh, motivating the researchers, scientists to develop new materials. Therefore, this uh, review uh, study uh, deals with the uh, study the effect of uh, reinforcement uh, uh, in terms of fibers with particles on polymer hybrid compounds. Uh, on the mechanical uh, characterization, uh, that to say tensile, flexural, impact, hardness, strength. Uh, actually include uh, uh, our objective to study the effect of this type of reinforcement, uh, particularly fibers and particles uh, on polymer hybrid composites in terms of the physical characterizations, that to say thermal conductivity and uh, density. Then we will uh, see the overview about the careful selection of size uh, direction, shape, and type of fibers and particles that affect the, uh, achieve the, uh, better and achieve better uh, characterizations. Uh, in the introduction, we have first to uh, define uh, the hybrid composite materials uh, are made of the two or more different uh, chemical constituents, and these uh, chemical constituents uh, uh, discontinuous in discontinuous phases. Uh, which is called the reinforcement and continuous phase, which is called matrix. We can see in the, from the chart in the uh, left uh, uh, side, the uh, classification of matrix composites, which uh, are three types, polymer, metal, and ceramic. We focused on the polymer matrix in this research, and we uh, have known uh, the polymer matrix. Uh, there are two types of the polymer matrix, either thermosets or thermoplastic. Uh, on the uh, right side, we can see the classification of reinforcement, which is either fiber or particles, and fibers uh, can be natural or scientific. Uh, in this, uh, our research, we uh, focused on the uh, take both of the fiber with, uh, with particles as reinforcement in the uh, polymer matrix composites. Related to the mechanical characterizations, uh, special uh, characterization or, or most uh, significant uh, characterization, which is tensile uh, property. Tensile properties is one of the most significant mechanical properties. Uh, that's why, that's why uh, many researchers interested to study about this uh, property. Uh, Karen in 2018 explored that 2% of alumina plus silicon carbide par particles with glass fiber and epoxy composites improved that about 22% in ultimate sensor, uh, tensile strength, whereas 2% of titanium oxide with uh, silicon carbide particles uh, improves the ultimate tensile strength around 14%. As we see from the figure one, the effect of uh, different type of particles with the glass fiber and epoxy uh, composites uh, on the ultimate tensile strength and young molecules. Another research, uh, Madhui, in 20, uh, 2000, sorry, 21, used the glass with uh, uh, calcium silicate nanoparticles uh, in epoxy uh, matrix, and they found that the addition of 3% of calcium silicate nanoparticles increased the tensile uh, properties by 55%. Uh, uh, and uh, one of the results of this research is uh, showing, uh, is uh, observed in uh, figure two, uh, the effect of the perc uh, weight percentage of uh, uh, calcium silicate on the uh, tensile uh, strength. Related to the another property, which, uh, which is uh, flexural uh, characteristics or uh, flexural strength, which is also important of bending performance of polymer hybrid composite, and it is known uh, as rupture modulus bending strength or uh, transfer rupture strength. Uh, uh, therefore, the polymer component have 
to lower stiffness than ceramic and uh, metals. Enforcement are used to these uh, composites to overcome these problems to increase the, uh, this lower uh, stiffness. Uh, uh, Mohammed in 2021 uh, suggested that this, this suppressed alumina nanoparticles and graphite nanoplatelet in uh, fiber uh, reinforcement polymer uh, composite that use in the turbine plate produce uh, uh, increase in the mechanical characteristic, uh, especially uh, in terms of the flexural strength. Also, Rena in the same field in 2021 found the addition of caliber, uh, caliber, sorry, uh, fiber with nanoparticle of silicon carbide to epoxy improved the uh, bending strength uh, and the increasing that it was uh, 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 they uh, dis uh, discovered or they found that the uh, when increase the weight or percent of the uh, silicon carbide will uh, uh, get increasing in the uh, flexural strength as we see uh, from the results of this research in uh, figure three. If we come to uh, uh, to talk about the another uh, impact uh, or, or another properties mechanical properties which, which is uh, impact uh, characteristics uh, uh, defines this uh, uh, impact strength actually defines the uh, impedance against the impact load that exists by hybrid composite without failure uh, and uh, it is also one of the uh, important properties uh, mechanical uh, properties. Uh, ready in two, two, uh, 2020 found uh, uh, that the granite particles are added to the polyester composite reforms with the natural fiber called the dichotma at uh, rate uh, 50 percent uh, will increase the citri, uh, impact strength gradually uh, and another study uh, al in 2021 uh, they uh, they found that the mechanical properties of, of the polypropylene matrix are improved the, uh, by combining with the glass fiber and rubber powder, and they discovered that the increase uh, the uh, rubber powder will increase the uh, uh, impact strength, wh whereas the increase the uh, glass fiber will lead to the decrease in the impact strength. As we see, one of the results in this of this uh, research in Figure Four, the impact strength. Uh, decreasing with the uh, increasing the fiber class fractions percent. Now we come to the final uh, or last uh, uh, mechanical uh, characterization, which is hardness. Uh, uh, actually, there are many researchers interested to study the hardness properties in this field. Uh, one of them, uh, Papa Ki uh, and Etl in 2021. Uh, they used alumina with the graphite nanoplate with the carbon and uh, glass fiber reinforcement epoxy resin. And they uh, recorded that the reinforcement with these particles, uh, two type particles, uh, affected in, uh, especially or particularly at percent 1.5 percent. Uh, to the to the reason matrix will provide significant improvement in the hardness. Another study uh, in uh, 2000, uh, uh, Babo or uh, Rama Chandra and uh, Rama Chandra uh, in 2020 uh, year uh, observed that the epoxy polypropylene fiber pack with the silicon carbide particles will increase the mechanical uh, properties uh, greatly. Uh, and they reached to uh, maximum hardness uh, value of 85 percent, uh, or uh, sorry, uh, 85 uh, required hardness for the component uh, having 14 percent epoxy, 50 uh, percent, 50 percent uh, fiber with uh, 10 percent of silicon carbide. Uh, uh, Ms. Shiva, uh, uh, please, uh, yes. sorry to interrupt. Uh, I think you are getting out of time. Sorry, sorry, please, sorry. Uh, Just, I, Okay, I'll summarize okay. it uh, uh, shortly. Okay, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, also related to the physical characterizations, uh, we uh, we focus on the thermal conductivity and density characterization. Thermal conductivity is became uh, very important uh, properties uh, for, especially for electronic apparatus. That's why the many researchers interested 
uh, to study this uh, properties because it is effect on the requirement of for integration if it's, uh, integration and efficiency of the electronics uh, raja in two, uh, two, 20, uh, 2021 uh, conducted uh, thermal examination and they found that the bamboo with the glass fiber uh, and uh, in nano and micro diameter of coconut particles would increase the thermal conductivity. Another study, uh, study uh, Hassan uh, Zadeh, in tw 2022, developed continuous carbon fibers in, in directional hybrid epoxy resin, and they found that the, uh, uh, this type of fiber with the graphene nanoplated will improve the thermal conductivity, as we see in the figure uh, 7. Uh, related to the uh, uh, another study, 2020, uh, 20, uh, uh, in the same uh, uh, study about the thermal conductivity, they found that the silicon carbide with the uh, uh, glass fiber and epoxy uh, matrix will increase the uh, thermal conductivity as we, we see in the figure eight. Uh, related to the density characteristics, uh, which is one of the uh, physical properties, Arshad uh, and ETL 20, uh, 2021 found the real density and it, the, uh, discrepancies with the actual density increase with the enforcement of bio and scientific uh, epoxy composite, as we see in the, uh, in the figure nine. Uh, and uh, with, with the report, when reports with this uh, epoxy with the uh, titanium uh, carbide nanoparticles. We uh, now come to the conclusion of this uh, study review. The conclusion of the review study, uh, firstly, it was found that the epoxy enforcement with the fiber particles mat uh, materials is commonly used in the automobile aerograft and uh, due to the uh, strength to weight ratio and uh, uh, another uh, characterization like abrasion resistance, chemical resistance, uh, compared to the other polymers. Uh, uh, secondly, it was noted that natural fiber, uh, such as uh, jet sizzle, uh, will uh, uh, used uh, in uh, biomedical uh, application due to uh, their biodegradation and low cost. Uh, thirdly, using synthesis uh, fiber or carbon fibers uh, and the glass fiber uh, give unique mechanical characterization to the polymer hybrids. Finally, it has been found that the mechanical and physical characterization are all affected by uh, in, in polymer component with changing particle enforcement in terms of the type and size. Actually, uh, I also either moreover the addition uh, uh, strength between the matrix and fibers, the, uh, the direction of the fiber, the weight ratio of the fiber and particle, as well as the length of the fiber affects significantly, significantly on the um, uh, physical characterizations, uh, where addition of particles increases the thermal conductivity and density. Uh, thank you for uh, your listening. Uh, please, if there is any questions. Also, hello. So, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I actually I'm calling Harish. So, so are oh. you there? So, uh, Ms. Suha, I have one question to you. Yes. Am I audible? Uh, yes, yes sir. please. Hello? Uh, Hello? Yes, sir, you are audible. I am audible? Yes, sir, yes, sir, you are. Yes, sir. So, I have only one question. Yes. Uh, that, uh, what is the salient outcome of this review? How we can use this review work in upcoming research? Uh, actually, it is a part of my uh, student uh, MTX uh, study. Uh, 
uh, we start first about the uh, study review about the uh, the uh, using the fiber with particles together with different percent on the in the matrix polymer matrix and uh, then we uh, started uh, actually started to uh, do it experimentally and uh, that, that's why i introduced this paper the first paper of my uh, student uh, to study about to take overview about this subject okay thank you thank you Welcome. all my best wishes thank you thank you thank you ma'am for your presentation now thank you now i would request bhavin mehta to present their paper on the title synthesis and characterization of gamma a1203 water nanofluid with and without surfactant good afternoon to one and all uh, just a minute Is the screen uh, visible? Yes, it is. Okay. So uh, my uh, today's topic of presentation is uh, synthesis and characterization of gamma Al two O three water nanofluid with and without surfactant. Uh, myself is Bhavin Mehta, working as an assistant professor. Changa. outline of presentation uh, this presentation includes the introduction section which is followed by a, a nanofluid potential in heat transfer application then the synthesis of nanofluids uh, stability evaluation of nanofluid thermal conductivity and viscosity measurement and uh, ended with the conclusion so, uh, so the basic thing about the working fluids used for heat transfer are having a lower uh, thermal properties that is basically the heat transfer coefficient and its thermal conductivity which ultimately affects the nusselt number and uh, the need to enhance the rate of heat transfer is to enhance the uh, nusselt number and ultimately the heat transfer coefficient so to augment the thermal performance it is essential to improve the thermophysical properties of the conventional working fluids and uh, one of the way to improve the thermophysical properties is to add nano sized solid particles in the base fluid that is called the nanofluid nanofluids are the potential heat transfer fluids which enhances the thermophysical properties and improves the thermal performance of any device and enhances the heat transfer rate now due to the lower particle size of the nano uh, particles used to synthesize the nano fluid the range of the particle may vary from uh, say 0 to 100 nanometer theoretically but generally uh, for experimentation the particles used are having size in the range of uh, 20 to 40 nanometer particle if i brief about the classification then uh, we can say the uh, nanofluids could be categorized in the four groups say the metallic nanofluids which includes the nanoparticles uh, from uh, basically consist of the metals uh, the metal oxide nanofluids uh, carbon based nanofluids that includes the single wall carbon nanotubes multi wall carbon nanotubes graphene particles etc and hybrid nanofluids, which is the combination of first three, maybe two or three. I will just quickly go through the attracting features of the nanofluids. So basically, uh, the due to higher thermal conductivity of the nanoparticles the, compared to the base fluid, so the effective thermal conductivity of the nanofluid is quite high compared to base fluid. The, uh, base fluid particles comes in contact with the nanoparticles and it forms one uh, hydrodynamic layer and that causes the enhancement in the surface area uh, basically the nanoparticles uh, suspended in the base fluid that develop 
the collision of the particles that is called brownian motion that also causes the enhancement in thermal conductivity the presence of particles in the fluid causes the turbulence and the interference which is also responsible for heat transfer enhancement this solid particles gets aggregates and separates continuously and they are also continuously migrated from their uh, places so that causes also the enhancement in thermal conductivity the inclusion of these particles in the base fluid causes the rise in pressure drop that is the uh, adverse effect of the nano fluid but this uh, the uh, rise in the pumping power will be lesser compared to the uh, augmentation in the heat transfer so ultimately the up to certain volume fraction the nano fluids will be showing the overall good performance compared to conventional working fluids and uh, at last <coughs> the nano particles possess good absorption and Uh, extension coefficient so basically it also uh, founds its suitability for uh, the uh, direct absorption type uh, collector solar collectors nano fluids could be synthesized by a single step method or two step methods in a single step method the synthesis and dispersion of nano particles uh, in the conventional fluid is performed simultaneously while in two step methods the first synthesized nanoparticles are considered and they are dispersed in the base fluid with the help of uh, mechanical stability techniques like say magnetic stirring uh, synthesis using ultrasonic bath propsonication and combination of them one step method is less popular for mass production due to the uh, uh, infrastructure required for that and it causes the uh, higher manufacturing cost while two step methods are more popular compared to one step method for uh, the development of the synthesis of nano fluids now in this experiment we have taken the uh, al203 nanoparticles uh, which consist of 20 m in 20 nanometer uh, particle size uh, the density is uh, 3960 kg per cubic meter and thermal conductivity of the particles uh, was observed 35 watt per meter kelvin we have purchased it from nano shell uh, the deionized water of quantity 200 micro uh, sorry ml uh, is considered for the uh, experimentation and the nano particles were added in this uh, base fluid uh, having uh, various Uh, volume fractions 0.3% 0.5% and 0.75 percentage then uh, for synthesis of this nano fluid uh, the fluids were prepared with the said volume fraction using uh, the surfactant as well as without using the surfactant and the study aim of the study is to check the effect of surfactant on the stability and also to find the thermal conductivity and viscosity so for that we have uh, used the magnetic stirrer and the uh, nano particles were added in the base fluid and it is constantly stirred for 1 hour at the constant speed of 500 uh, rpm and uh, then uh, with the help of propsonicator vc505 uh, and having 500 watt uh, its rating uh, power and 20 kilohertz uh its frequency and it is uh, uh sonicated continuously for 60 minutes for a, a proper dispersion of the uh, nanoparticles in the base fluid then uh, stability is of this nano fluid is evaluated uh for uh, by various methods the one of the method is visual inspection where the uh sample is uh, continuously uh, monitored for 5 days and uh, we found the negligible uh, sedimentation of the particles and the fluid could be uh, uh, considered as a stable fluid for with and without surfactant the first uh, figure shows the uh, fluid uh, synthesized with the sdbs surfactant and the second set of photos shows the uh, fluid without surfactant and both are showing the better stability 
and basically this uh, image we have take considered for 5.5 percent volume fraction similarly uh, we have also evaluated the stability of the nanofluid by the dls technique and for that we have uh, use the instrument which is called a zeta sizer and for that we found <laughs> the results like the average uh, particle size uh, in the uh, tested fluid was found to be 24 nanometers for with the fluid which uh, synthesized with the surfactant of sdbs and the volume fraction is 0.5 percent and similarly it found uh, the particle size average particle size found to be 28 nanometer which is quite nearer to the uh, uh, particle of the nano uh, nanoparticles uh, that is 20 nanometers so we can say that there is no such agglomeration and the sedimentation and fluid is uh, stable and it, it shows the good stability at the end of the fifth day then we have used the uv inspection uv spectrometer is used and we found the uh, we have tested this fluid for continuous five days and uh, for uh, various uh, concentration 0.3 percent 0.5 percent 0.75 percent and uh, uh, we found that the drop in the uh, absorbance is negligible during the five days so it shows the better stability Thermal conductivity of the nanofluid was measured by uh, KD2 Pro thermal uh, analyzer, and uh, uh, we have compared the result with the uh, models, uh, suggested models, Maxwell model and Zian model. I have shown this model here. Uh, the uh, result shows that there is a marginal rise in the thermal conductivity with uh, the volume fraction. Uh, at uh, at the sixth day of the uh, synthesis uh, of the nanofluid and uh, it shows the better thermal conductivity and thermal conductivity increases with increase in the volume fraction the viscosity of the nanofluid uh, is measured with the enton par rheometer uh, which is available at the institute and uh, uh, we found that uh, the there is a uh, drastic rise in the viscosity also uh, but the results were deviated from the suggested models for higher volume fractions but for lower fra volume fractions the results uh, suggested by the sharma model was quite uh, in agreement with the uh, actual results So the conclusion about the experiment is the two-step method is uh, efficient method to synthesize the stable nanofluid. SDBS, SDBS surfactant could be used uh, to enhance the stability. With rise in volume fraction, thermal conductivity and viscosity increases. Uh, the rise in the thermal conductivity is around 10 percentage, while the viscosity is increased by 15 to 20 percentage. The use of surfactant has an adverse effect on the thermal conductivity of the nanofluid so nanofluid without uh, surfactant shows the better thermal conductivity compared to uh, uh, sur uh, nanofluid with surfactant and it has a uh, rise in the viscosity if we use the if we synthesize the nanofluid with surfactant compared to without surfactant the experimental results of thermal conductivity of nanofluids are having a good agreement with the theoretical models while in the viscosity we found some uh, uh, deviation from the predicted values at a higher volume fraction so at last we we can say that the if we want to synthesize the nanofluid below one percentage volume fraction then we can synthesize without uh, use of surfactant and that could give you the better uh, thermal conductivity compared to the using the uh, surfactant but the role of surfactant will be significant for stability enhancement when the volume fraction will be above one percentage so in the near future we are uh, trying to investigate the long-term effect of uh, this surfactant on the stability 
and uh, the effect of surfactant on the stability of the nanofluid if synthesized with higher volume fraction up to say 3 to 5 percentage that's it for this presentation the references which are considered for this study are listed here thank you any questions Thank you, uh, Bhavin, for your presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you yes, sir. that uh, why uh, you are interested to study related to nanofluid only? Uh, actually, sir, uh, we want to use this uh, fluid, basically synthesized fluid, for investigation of the performance of uh, the devices where the heat transfer is uh, uh, essential. So our next plan is to use the same fluid for uh, studying the performance uh, where the natural convection or say the uh, force convection is involved and uh, how the deviation in the results comes. That's what we want to study. So that's why our first step is to have uh, the uh, getting the uh, thermophysical properties of this nanofluid. Good, uh, you, you keep on extending this work. So now uh, if, uh, uh, other participants and uh, uh, faculties, if they are willing, they can ask further questions. Thank you, sir. I would like to request participants and other HOD uh, members who are watching this, any questions so we can proceed further. No, no problem. Tanu, Tanu, you, okay, Tanu, you okay. can uh, okay, uh, okay. proceed with the next paper. And thanks to Bhavin Mehta for presenting uh, such a nice work. Thank so, you, uh, invite uh, Thank sir. you for your remarkable uh, comment. It In means my a best lot for me. For your rest of the research work. Please Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for your presentation. Now I would like to call Rajat Kumar in the spotlight to present their paper on the title Temperature and Strain Rate Dependent Tensile Behavior of Polycrystalline Nanocopper Under Dynamic Loading. Rajat, uh, uh, before starting, I have one request to you. Uh, please uh, adhere to the timelines. So your voice is not audible. Uh, can you please check your internet connection?
Tanu, is there any problem with the uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, I guess so. Uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, net connectivity. Uh, if uh, there is problem, we can invite the next one. And uh, the moment next is over, we can invite uh, Mr. Rajat Hello. to present. Okay, so I guess so he is uh, present now. Rajat Kumar, are you there? Uh, give okay, give, give you me a chance here. to present. Hear me now. Uh, yes, uh, you are audible now. Yes, so let me go, uh, first give a brief introduction about the nanocrystalline metals. So these are the metals that are comp uh, comprised of various grains that have different sizes and orientations. Now we have uh, come to such a advanced stage at the fabrication techniques and we have good experimental equipments that has triggered the attraction towards nanocrystalline metals uh, scientifically and technologically both. So, the why we are focusing on the nanomaterials is because they have superior structural and practical properties as compared to that, that of coarse grain materials. And as we all know that copper is uh, one of the high thermal and electric conductive metal uh, have, that, has, that have high melting and boiling point. So uh, these nano coppers are particularly used in the applications of integrated circuits micro electromechanical systems nano electromechanical systems and medical applications so in order to study these metals the atomistic simulations provide an extra edge over the experimental studies that are time consuming and also the resource consuming so main objective of our research is uh, divided into two parts the first part deals with the effect of strain rate on the mechanical properties and the second part deals with the effect of temperature on the mechanical properties so uh, in this paper uh, we have first constructed a grain of sorry we have first constructed the uh, polycrystalline nano copper uh, as you can see in the right hand side figure so uh, this uh, this crystal contains eight number of grains and it has a uh, average grain size of nine uh, six uh, nine point three eight nanometer so, uh, and the bottom image you can see are of the grains. The green atoms shows the uh, atoms of copper uh, that is particularly face centered cubic, and the white colored atoms shows grain boundaries. The and then after the generation of the sample, uh, the first step is to apply the boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions help us to uh, analyze the metal in order that. Uh, when we are simulating in the real environment, then after each stage, our atoms should not lose from the uh, environment. So in order to keep the number of atoms constant, we are we apply boundary conditions. After that, the EAM or embedded atom method potential is used. And this atom is used to describe the interaction among atoms by using the Newton's second law of motion. After that, the uh, the sample is put under the tensile loading conditions, where the strain rate is varied from five into ten to the power eight second, and it ranges as, as high as to five into ten to the power ten per second. Uh, as per the second objective of our research uh, research, the temperature is varied in this section from one hundred to five hundred Kelvin in the steps of one hundred Kelvin. So upon uh, performing this uh, uniaxial tensile testing, what we found is that the Young's modulus uh, depends on the strain rate. When we have observed that when the strain rate was low, then the material shows uh, low mechanical properties like its Young modulus is uh, around 16 gigapascal and also its yield strength is uh, 0 0.19 gigapascal. And when we increase the strain rate, we have found that the Young's modulus increased up to as high as 25 or uh, 26 gigapascal, and the uh, yield strength increased from 0 0.9 gigapascal to approximately 3 gigapascal. So we can say that the uh, mechanical properties they are uh, uh, directly proportional to the uh, strain rate as we increase the high as we increase the strain rate the uh, pro, uh, the metal shows high properties contrary to uh, to the strain rate when the temperature effect is observed 
we have found this interesting fact that uh, like uh, in case of strain rate the properties are directly uh, increasing with the strain rate but in the case of temperature the properties they are almost uh, inversely relation related to the temperature for example the yin's modulus uh, was around 42.4 gigapascal at 100 kelvin and the temperature and when temperature is raised it increase uh, it decreased to 23.2 gigapascal also we have performed the common neighbor analysis using the ovito and it shows that the uh, when the uh, when the metal is at the initial stage then the percentage of fcc atoms was nearly around 70% but when the uh, when the uni but at the end of the uni axial test the composition of fcc atoms get reduced to around uh, 40 to 50% and also some of the grain migrations were also observed in the uni axial testing so uh, in a nutshell we can say that the strain rate directly affects the mechanical properties and the grain boundary shifting or grain boundary sliding these are the major deformation mechanism that were observed in our test and also the temperature has uh, inverse effect on the mechanical properties and which is almost linear now the further uh, research has been carried out by uh, by us in this field where we are uh, we are focusing on generating an equation or relation which will predict about the temperature and mechanical properties uh, with the with different parameters so yeah this is all about the research if you have any questions you can ask Oh. Nice presentation, Razat. Okay, thank you, sir. Any uh, questions? Uh, do we have any questions? So, uh, and I request all the HOD members and the participants. Uh, for the question to be asked. I think there are none. Oh, okay. So, uh, Harish sir, shall we proceed further? Uh, do you have any question or uh, we shall proceed further? So thank you, sir, for your presentation. Uh, now I would like to call Sidra Ajmal and his spotlight to present their paper on the title Recent Progress in Development and Applications of Biomaterials. Thank you, Sir Tanushree. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Let me share my screen.
Is it visible? Yes, it is visible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon to one and all present here. Myself, Sidra Ajmal. I am doing. I am pursuing B.Tech in the field of mechanical engineering from Jamia Millia Islamia. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude towards Ajay Kumar Garg Engineering College for giving me the opportunity to present my paper titled Recent Progress in Development and Applications of Biomaterial. So we have divided the contents into various slides that is introduction, purpose of this study, classification, testing techniques, application and conclusion. We will go uh, towards each of the topic one by one. Now let's start with the introduction one. So what are biomaterials? Biomaterial are natural or synthetic substances that came into contact with biological systems and aid to repair, replace or enhance any tissue or organ of the body. Biomaterials comprises of several components and refer to the entire body system. For example, biomaterial could be as simple as a urinary catheter or as complicated as a glucose sensor which is kept inside the body or it could be a permanent fixture such as a cardiovascular stand or a stainless stand implant inside the body which is used to replace the bone. Biomaterials has various applications in the dental field uh, which includes like in medical industries such as tissue engineering, orthopedic implants, hip prosthesis, etc. Several developments ha have been taking place on the basis of the types of biomaterials and such applications enhance the nature of living for many beneficiaries including the elderly with extensive life expectancies and younger people with cardiac difficulties, traumas or genetic disorders. The first generation of biomaterials was very crucial for minimizing the tissue reactivity when the body does not completely absorb these compounds, a thin fibrous layer develops between them and the rest of the body. And now we have biocompatibility. So you all might be wondering what is biocompatibility? Biocompatibility is a general term describing the property of a material being compatible with the living tissues. Biocompatibility assessment of safety is concerned with determining an appropriate host response. The various key elements which influence the biocompatibility environment in are environmental interactions, implant period, surface biocompatibility, biocompatibility of the structure, function, size and proportion, as well as the material. Environmental interaction includes allergic responses, the effect of cytotoxins, inflammatory process, degree of degradation, and chemical interaction with the blood, whereas implant application is generally classified into long-term and short-term implants. Then we have the purpose of the study. Our research work basically has the following objects. It highlights the advances in the modern technology, which increase the accessibility to understand tissue generation and diseases to study the classification of the biomaterials based on their material type and properties and its application, to study the recent develop developments in the biomaterials and to broaden the overview of applications in various domains. Now, we have the classification of the biomaterial based upon its material type. Based on the chemical nature of the substances, biomaterial can be categorized into four categories like we can see biomaterials have two main categories that is inorganic and organic. In the inorganic one, we have metallic and ceramic compounds. Metallic compounds are uh, the traditional, uh, these materials have been traditionally been utilized uh, for load bearing capacities such as bones, knees, dental implants, which owe mm -hmm. remarkable and dominating mechanical properties. For example, we have iron alloys, and um, titanium, chromium and cobalt alloys, which are the most often used metallic biomaterials. And then we have ceramics and carbon compounds. Ceramics have low thermal conductivity um, and are resistant to breakdown and compression. Bioceramics have been traditionally been employed basically in mechanical grabs. And then in the organic one, we have polymers and biocomposites. Polymers among different biomaterials, biopolymers are widely regarded as biomechanically most suitable materials. As opposed of their alternatives, synthetic biopolymers, including bioceramics and metallic, are widely employed. 
the man made polymers are used in basically drug delivery system disposable metallic uh, medical materials prosthesis bandages etc now we will discuss about biocomposites biocomposites are the material created by combining two or more biologically significant materials with distinct physical chemical and morphological qualities this figure basically represents the metallic biomaterial which are used to like screws for which is used in the hip joint replacement etc and then we have the classification based upon application and its uses we have categorized types advantages disadvantages fabrication techniques and uses like as you all know um, a system has advantage as well as disadvantages too in metals uh, as metals possesses good mechanical properties it has a disadvantage that it is corrosive uh, various fabrication techniques have been used like additive manufacturing and it is used in fracture fixation uh, next move on to carbon compounds and ceramics uh, it is highly biocompatible but it is brittle and uh, the fabrication technique used to fabricate carbon compounds is fdm sls etc uh, the major uses of carbon compounds is in this industry of artificial hearing aids hip prosthesis etc polymers are uh, polymers have an edge to like they are biodegradable bioactive biocompatible but they possess poor mechanical properties low mechanical strength fabrication techniques used to fabricate polymers are polylithography nano imprinting which has wide range of applications in the domain of tissue engineering drug delivery system etc composite materials have the advantage ki that they have excellent mechanical properties they are corrosive resistant they are biocompatible but they are expensive and have poor strength the fabrication techniques used to fabricate uh, composite materials are filament winding infusion injection and they have huge domains in the application in the field of dental fillings regenerative medical uh, applications this figure basically represents the bone fracture of the knee joint in the knee joint then we have various fixing techniques like in the wake of such advances in medical it is important to ensure the safety and efficacy of medical equipments and technologies greater efforts are being made to strengthen the evaluation standards and regulation governing the standardization of measuring devices and test methods so for that testing procedure standards are issued by the Uh, indian is international standard organizations and the american society for testing and materials <coughs> to meet these requirements various tests are performed which are categorized into biological requirements and mechanical requirements in the biological requirements we have various tests like biocompatible biocompatibility vitro test animal test clinical test etc whereas in the mechanical requirements we have corrosion test corrosion testing is a crucial test where in the implants are exposed to an intensive corrosive environment containing blood and other bodily fluids which comprises of multiple components such as water sodium chlorine etc next we have various domains of applications by of biomaterials in various sectors like you can see in the figure uh, we have different domains of biomaterials which are listed and the applications of use in the various domains we will discuss each application one by one let's start with the orthodontic one orthodontic implants or fixtures commonly referred to as dental implants attach the jaw bone to the skull allowing dental prosthesis such as bridges crowns etc to be supported while simultaneously function as an orthodontic anchor osseo integration osseo integration is the fundamental process used fundamental process for dental implants and then we have hard cementum dentum enable and soft dental pulp tissues which are made up of dental tissues next we have cardiovascular system cardiovascular systems are among the most popular uses of biomaterials certain cardiovascular disorders significantly influence the quality of life and cannot be addressed with uh, only with medications implants can successfully address the difficulties caused by the cardiac value and artery failure 
so heart valves cardiopulmonary bypass surgery vascular graft pacemakers stents etc are the examples of biomedical devices which are being used in the cardiovascular applications like we can have uh, so we can have heart valves which is one of the when one of the uh, four heart valves fails an artificial heart valve is inserted into the heart of an valvular heart disease point hmm. and there are certain properties as well stents and grafts which are listed below now let's talk about drug delivery system our medication delivery systems ultimate process is to liberate the drug at the correct movement and in the right concentration at a designated target location to be very effective the active component in any formulation must be bio available in optical levels at the target location in the human body drug delivery methods in the pharma industry rely on the active ingredient the drug uh, that is the drug delivery or dosage form so this diagram represents the various applications of orthodontics intraocular lenses cardiovascular and orthopedic systems in the human body then we have ophthalmic <coughs> ophthalmic in which we will discuss basically about intraocular lenses like uh, during the cataract surgery artificial iols are routinely in for, uh, installed to restore the normal refractive power the opacified contents of the cataractus lens capsular bags are removed and the iol is put into the capsular bag and iol biocompatibility is a critical criteria and the duration and strength of Each cellular reaction vary depending on the bio material. However, because of its modest industry, it is clinically very important. Acrylic or silicon lenses are used uh, to make IOLs. Depending upon their flexibility, acrylic materials can be foldable as well as non-foldable. Poly, meta, methyl acrylate are the Sorry foldable. Sorry to interrupt, uh, uh, Sadra Ajman. Uh, you are ex uh, exceeding your time limit. So can can you uh, do it fast? Yeah, I'll just summarize. And basically, it's used uh, as a foldable lens, which is uh, made up of hydrophobic or hydrophilic acrylates, and then silicon have the ability to be folded. Then we have the orthopedic section, the branch of clinical medicine which deals with the fracture and fixation of bone, joint malformation, etc. all together known as orthopedic then we have discussed various categories that is joint prosthesis and bone repair joint prosthesis is also shown in the figure uh, joint prosthesis uh, in human body many types of joints are present which exist which enables the movement of body and its part like knee shoulder and elbow are a synonical type joints and which have free movement next we have tissue engineering Tissue engineering can be defined as a multi and interdisciplinary field in which the principles of the engineering and life sciences are applied toward the generation of biological substituents aimed at the formation, preservation, or restoration of lost organ function. Hence, the application of biomaterials in tissue engineering have been the notable attention for biomedical science researcher from decades ago. And the last application we listed is of biosensors. biosensors a biosensor is a laboratory instrument which basically detects the transformation of the biological process into electrical signals biological biosensors have ways tracking and management applications patient psychiatric diagnosis architectural investigations monitoring of health parameters and water quality checks biosensory mechanical gears are being commonly used in general healthcare monitoring illness diagnosis in the wearing and clinical studies now uh, these have been the different sites of the human body in which biomaterial are being used and we will discuss uh, the material types and its application in the next slide so we have uh, hydroxyapatite on titanium hydroxyapatite powder a uh, hydroxyapatite coating on mag uh, magnesium and its alloy collagen based biomaterial beta triphosphate which has the properties uh, like they have high mechanical stress they are harmless low crystallinity they are corrosion resistant low mechanical strength good biocompatibility and they are been uh, variously used in orthopedic implants tissue regeneration theranostics dental bone tissue engineering orthopedics 
they have various uses at different size like uh, hydroxy appetite can be used uh, for load bearing a hydroxy appetite coating on titanium can be used for cell adhesion uh, and uh, magnesium alloy coating can be used as an inorganic compound with limited water solubility that they can easily classify calcify in hard tissues next we have uh, we conclude our presentation which is biomaterials are seen to exhibit like biomaterials offers potential for multidisciplinary in any field biomaterials can being or bioactive such as those utilized in hard walls hydroxy apatite coated hip plants for example are more interactive and can last up to 20 years and although there is tremendous potential applications for allover bone tissue engineering applications which are being in investigated and uh, perspective research in biocompatible ionic liquids and bioelectronics and the evaluating potential combining of biomaterials in regenerative studies medicines and that's all from my side thank you any questions hello uh sidra very good presentation uh kindly yes. discuss what are the salient outcome of your research yes pardon can you please uh may i repeat uh, i shall repeat the question he is asking what are the salient feature or uh, salient outcomes of your research paper okay so we have to track the recent applications uh, like we have been as i have discussed over the presentation also okay like uh, biomaterials exhibit remarkable environmental stability high stretchability mechanical strength and such properties uh, for applications which have huge applications in the field of tissue regeneration dental implants biosensors etc and uh, in the fbr materials anti fbr materials which is the on growing research field we believe more demonstrations and applications of anti fbr materials will emerge in the new features such as implantable sensors and biodrug sensors and there are various applications too and like in the future scope we can work on nano composites bioplastics uh, based on cellulose etc Okay. Uh, thank you, Sir Ajmal, for your presentation. Uh, any other questions from the participants? Okay. So uh, we are proceeding with our next presentation. I would like to call Lubad Nisa in the spotlight to present their paper on the title "Defects Analysis in Friction Stir Processing of Magnesium-Based Surface Composites." is my presentation visible uh yes good afternoon everyone i am lubad nisar currently pursuing my bachelor's in mechanical engineering at nit srinagar the title of my presentation is defect analysis in friction stress processing of magnesium based surface composites these are some of the contents that i will go through now the introduction friction stress processing it is a modified technique and emerged from friction stress welding which was invented by thoms at all at the welding institute cambridge this particular technique friction stress processing was developed by mishra and others and has been utilized as grain refinement method and has become very popular in the fabrication of composites like metal matrix composites and surface composites in this in this process basically a mowing and rotating non consumable tool is inserted onto the specimen and the tool translates along a particular direction with constant traveling speed when the tool translates and rotates the heat is produced at the expense of friction between the tool and the workpiece the friction and severe plastic deformation are the main 
respons are responsible for localized producing heat, which leads to the softening of workpiece material and eases the motion of material from front to the back of the tool pin. This uh, process leads to uh, microstructure modification and results in removal of uh, defects caused by pores and uh, cracks during casting. This process is actually based on uh, certain process parameters, which include uh, the rotational speed of the uh, pin, the traverse speed, the plunge depth, the tilt angle, etc., which if not chosen correctly, will result in the formation of will result in the formation of uh, defects. These defects further deteriorate the mechanical properties of our processes zone. So some of the defects that we observe in uh, throughout the friction strip processing are as follows, which um, the first is the tunneling defect. This is one of the most common defect that arise uh, due to the less heat input, which results in inadequate plasticization of material and improper material movement around the pin. In this case, actually, the tool penetrates further, resulting in less deposition of material in the gap left behind it, making a tunnel. That is why it is called as tunneling defect. Now the wormhole, this is a cavity caused by the lack of convergence of material flowing uh, across different zones due to lack of material driving force. It is most noticeable at the junction uh, of uh, uh, state zone and the thermomechanically affected zone on the advancing side. This defect is primarily uh, caused by less rotation speed. Now other defect is surface lack of fill. It is also a type of void which is majorly caused when the pin length is too short in comparison with the plate thickness. It is also caused by low heat generation. Next is nugget collapse. Usually it is found in the uh, state zone of the processes material actually it is caused by high heat generation the high heat generation leads to the formation of intermetallic compounds which are hard and brittle and result in deteriorating the mechanical properties of the material which are ductility and strength the other one is flash defect this is this occurs due to high rotation speed which produces large amount of heat generation actually when a large amount of heat is generated, the material becomes overly soft. And with addition of shoulder pressure, the material is discharged from the edge, from the edge of the process zone, which in the form of flash. As we saw that primarily because of the heat input, these, um, these defects occur. That is why optimum heat generation is critical in the creation of uh, defect-free zones. Now the materials and methods. The material that we selected for carrying out this experimentation was ZD41 magnesium alloy. We used the plates measuring 140 into 75 into 5 millimeters. The tool material used for this experiment was high chromium, high carbon dye steel. And the dimensions of our tool are as follows. The tool profile was cylindrical. The tool shoulder length was 80 millimeter the tool shoulder diameter was 15 millimeter the pin length was 3.5 millimeter and the pin profile that we used was cylindrical tapered with a six millimeter root diameter now this setup the plates were cut using uh, wire edm F this fsp was uh, performed using a vertical milling machine which was uh, retrofitted am i audible uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, which was retrofitted with the help of a uh, suitable tool adapter and work fixture. We can see in this figure uh, the experimental setup, uh, the tool and the um, plates clamped. The parameters uh, used for the carrying out this experimentation were as the uh, rotation speed was set at uh, 1120 RPM, the traverse speed was set at 30 millimeter per minute and the tilt angle was kept at one degree. The plunge depth was varied. We actually used two plunge depths, which are 0.25 in meter and 0.3 millimeter. Then optical microscopy and field emission scanning electron microscopy were used to study the particle distribution and microstructure of the processed plates. 
Now these are the results that we got. The picture depicts the macro graphs and micro graphs. We can see in figure 2a the macro graph of the plate processed at 0.2 millimeter plunge depth. In figure 2b we can see the macro graph of the plate processed at 0.3 millimeter plunge depth. Then uh, using FESEM we got the micro graphs and we can clearly see that in in case when we when the plunge depth was 0.2 millimeter the tunnel was more prominent than in case of the time we used 0.3 millimeter plunge depth. Thus, we can uh, clearly say that increase in plunge depth has decreased the formation of tunneling defect. This defect is actually resulted from insufficient forging action due to insufficient plunge depth. Actually, insufficient plunge depth results in inadequate forging, which lowers the highest temperature, thus increasing the flow stress, which results in inadequate plastic deformation and sludge material movement. This uh, tunneling defect is uh, mostly caused by insufficient material consolidation and poor material mixing. Presence of this defect decreases the mechanical properties of the fabricated surface composites. As we know that the presence of this defect decreases the mechanical properties due to reduction in load carrying, load carrying cross-sectional area, thus decreasing the strength of the process zone. It arises from the undesirable parameter selection. Researchers concentrated on boosting heat input and enhancing material flow by adding secondary energy to avoid this defect. Now the conclusion. Owing to its novelty, the process has an undeniable future and is considered a clean fabrication method. The present work provides a thorough examination of defect development in friction steel processing as a result of inadvertent combination of FSP parameters. Improper parameter selection results in inadequate heat input, improper movement of material and insufficient accumulation, all of which degrade the mechanical characteristics of the processed materials. Insufficient plunge depth results in tunneling defect in the friction steel processed plates, which is primarily because of low heat input. These are some of the references. Thank you. Uh, I have one question. How yes. defects in material uh, affect the mechanical properties of uh, any component? So actually, if I uh, if I will talk about the particular tunnel defect, uh, we see a tunnel is uh, formed in in a particular region, which decreases the which decreases the cross sectional area of that particular component, thus decreasing the strength of that particular component. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Lubat Nisa, for your presentation. Now, we are proceeding with our next participants, that is Shashikant Avasti, to present their paper on the title Optimization of Magnesium ZK60A SIC B4C Hybrid Composite Fabricated by Friction Stir Processing. So are you here? I request uh, Shashikan so to present uh, his uh, presentation. Uh, he has some problem in his uh, inter internet issues. Uh, he has some internet issues. So we are moving further with our next participant. So I would like to call Mohammed Ziaur Rahman in his spotlight to present their paper on the title 
multi response optimization of gap parameters on mechanical properties of surface composites So your voice is not audible. Hello, good morning, everyone. Okay, good morning, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Is my screen visible? Ah, uh, no, sir. Is it visible now? Ah, uh, no, sir. Is it visible? Sanu, is there any paper next? No, sir. Uh, this is this one was last, and uh, uh, we have before it. It was our stream. Okay, okay. So now all, all with, papers are presented. Yes, sir. We are left with only two papers. Okay, okay. So they are not presented. Yes, sir. Sorry. Those two papers are not to be presented, or authors are not here to present. Uh, sir, Bhamas Yawar Rahman is here to present. I guess he has some problem in his internet, uh, so he is trying to connect. Uh, and uh, same Don't problem worry. is with uh, Shashikant Tavasti. Don't worry, we can wait one or two minutes. Okay. Sir. Uh, give them time. Okay. Sir. Don't worry. Hello, is my screen visible? No, we can't uh, see your screen. Yes, sir. Now it is visible. Okay. The topic of my presentation is multi-response optimization of FSP parameters on mechanical properties of surface composite. Contents of the presentation is introduction, experimental setup, results and discussion, conclusion and references. Introduction. Aluminum alloys find potential applications in aerospace, automotive and shipbuilding industry owing to their desirable characteristic properties such as lightweight, high specific strength, greater corrosion resistance and appreciable toughness. However, their applications are limited due to their poor surface properties, such as lower wear resistance and lower hardness. On the other hand, aluminum alloys lose their strength and functionality at higher operating temperatures due to their low melting point of, five, of 656 degrees Celsius. To encounter such problems, one of the alternatives is to enhance their properties by introducing hard components such as silicon carbide tungsten or titanium to the surface of the base alloy. Friction stir processing is one of the cost effective alternatives for fabricating metal matrix composite and is widely used to tailor the surface properties of base material. In friction stir processing, the reinforcements are introduced into the well-packed groove of predetermined size. <clears throat> Thermomechanical and stirring action of FSP tool plasticizes the base metal and leads to uniform distribution 
and embedment of reinforcement into the matrix. The plasticized metal matrix composite is subsequently forged at trailing side of tool due to axial force applied by the tool. The central aim of this study <coughs> is to investigate the optimum process parameters for obtaining the best mechanical properties such as hardness. Taguchi L8 <coughs> orthogonal array is used and the three input parameters have been taken as <coughs> tool rotational speed, transverse speed, and shoulder diameter size. This is the experimental setup nomenclature. The plate thickness is around 7 millimeter, 20 millimeter, 200 millimeter length, and 70 millimeter and seven millimeter thickness. Here we can see the shape of the tool. <coughs> Shoulder diameter has been taken as 17 millimeter and 20 millimeter. And the pin is <coughs> threaded with right hand threads. <coughs> the pin diameter is seven millimeter and pin length is five millimeter. Grooves of size 180 millimeter into 2.5 into 2 millimeter were cut in the mid of the plate along the length, in which mixture of titanium nano powder and silicon carbide powder was filled in the ratio 10 is to 3. <coughs> the following parameters were taken. <coughs> we had two levels of Shoulder diameter, 17 millimeter and 20 millimeter. Two levels of tool rotational speed, 355 RPM and 450 RPM. And two levels of traverse speed, 63 millimeter per minute and 80 millimeter per minute. And this is the design of experiment according to Taguchi L8 orthogonal array. These are the results we have obtained. The maximum <clears throat> vertical hardness was obtained in sample number eight, and while maximum horizontal hard HV value was obtained in experiment number five. <clears throat> Following optimization techniques have been used. Standard deviation method, <coughs> OPRAS method, ANOM, and Pareto ANOVA. The relative priority table is shown here. The relative priority <coughs> is in this order. Experiment number two has priority one and experiment number four has the last priority and in this table SN ratios are also shown. The enorm table for SN ratio was obtained to be this <coughs> for the three parameters. And this table shows the Pareto ANOVA for SM ratio. <coughs> so the contribution ratio of the parameter A is 13.040450. And of the B was also same. And C is 7.613. Conclusion. The ultimate tensile strength is found to be the most important response as its weight <coughs> is maximum, 0 0.3627, followed by horizontal HV value and vertical HV value. 
within the investigated range, the optimal setting of FSP parameters for the optimal multi responses is found to be 17 millimeter 355 RPM and 80 millimeter per minute. The rotational speed is observed to be the most significant parameters for affecting multi responses. This is all from my side. Hello, my today only these parameters. Yes. Sir, because these three parameters. Hello. Yes. These, because Hello, these, my one question why you selected only these process parameters? Sir, why? because in friction star processing, these three parameters are most significant. The shoulder diameter, the RPM, and the traverse speed. Uh, thank you, sir, for your presentation. So, uh, do we have Shashikan Tavasti here in the meet? Uh, sir, he has uh, some internet issues. So, he is not currently present in the meet. So, we are ending our session today. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Harish Kumar for being with us today. We are grateful to you for giving your precious time. Thank you so much, sir. Now, let us disperse for a break and reassemble sharp by 3 p.m. I request all of you to join the meeting five minutes prior. <laughs> Hello, uh, can you last presentation be connected? Uh, sir, he is uh, not currently present here. So, uh, we are okay, okay, no problem. So, uh, uh, is there any more paper left? No, sir, no, sir. No problem. You, you do one thing. Uh, you yes. can uh, mark uh, that paper is not presented. Okay, due to uh, some technical... Uh, yeah, because he was present uh, in the presentation. But uh, due to some connectivity issue, he was not able to present. So we should give him some benefit. Clear? Okay. You write him uh, could not present due to uh, tech connectivity issues from the whole, but the presenter side. Okay. okay. okay so um, I I am thankful to all the authors as well as all the colleagues <laughs> participated uh, and who presented their state of our sister's work. Really, the papers were much relevant to the theme of the conference and the general materials today proceedings. So I'm very sure these papers are likely to come very soon in the proceedings. And uh, once again, I thank uh, to the organizers uh, for uh, organizing such a state of art, uh, technically uh, very sound conference. So my best wishes to all the participants and attendees. Thank you. Uh Uh, sir, we are rescheduling uh, Shashikant Avasti because uh, he uh, has a, a no data left with him. So we are ending with this uh, technical session. Thank you, sir, for giving your precious time. Uh, I would like to uh, now let us disperse for a lunch and reassemble sharp by 3 p.m. I request all of you to join the meeting five minutes prior to it. Thank you, sir, and thank, thank you. you participants.